Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. This episode is brought to you by Mural, a digital workspace for visual collaboration. At Voltage Control, we use Mural to facilitate engaging and productive meetings and workshops from anywhere. Mural gives teams the means, methods, and freedom to collaborate visually. Use their suite of facilitation superpowers to control the virtual room and solve tough problems as a team with their pre-built templates and guided methods. To see for yourself why companies like IBM, Atlassian, and E-Trade rely on Mural, start your 30-day trial at Mural.co. That's M-U-R-A-L dot C-O. Today, I'm with Kristen Fulton, the Development and Operations Manager for Schools That Can, a national education nonprofit that is building an education to employment pathway that closes the opportunity and skills gap. Welcome to the show, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So for starters, would love to hear a little bit about how you got your start. Sure. So my start with Schools That Can, it came almost one of those things that seems random, but happened for a very specific reason. Um, I had originally applied for a job with Schools That Can after learning about the organization from my sister, who is a teacher. She's a teacher in Newark Public Schools, and um, she had initially worked with the organization through her school and was very fond of it, loved the people who work there, and um, saw the notice for a part-time programming uh, manager. And so I initially applied for that job. At the same time, I found out that I um, got into grad school and that I was moving from New Jersey to New York. And so I ended up um, not taking the job with schools that can, but then uh, several months later, an opening uh, came up in the New York City office. And so um, they reached out to me just out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it, but they reached out to me and said, we found your resume from, you know, from the Newark office. We're interested in interviewing you for this position. Are you still interested in our organization? And from there, I started working with them part time, which was great because I was still in school and uh, kind of moved my way up through the development department um, to where I am now. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about the work that that you do there and why this project is so important. Absolutely. Um, so I'll start with our mission. So Schools That Can builds an education to employment pathway that closes the opportunity and skills gap. And I start there because it's really important to understand how we're working, what we're working toward, and the folks that we're impacting. You know, education to employment is so important because very often, and this is statistically proven, you know, employers are often saying, we want to hire students who have these skills, but they don't have these skills. And some of the skills are definitely hard skills that they'll need to learn um, through their education, but some of them are also just soft skills, communication, critical thinking, decision-making, collaboration, all of those things. And so our organization thought um, through a lot of strategic planning and through research and time, we uh, thought, how do we really prepare students to enter the workforce from the beginning. So we work in K through 12 and we work uh, cross sector, which means that we work with district um, independent and charter schools. And we work from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade to really make sure that we're able to provide programs that do just that, that build on all of those skills. So students are learning those soft skills that are super important. And at the same time, they're also learning those hard skills, things that they'll need for STEM for STEM jobs, things they'll need for engineering and math and so forth, things they'll need for finance or things they'll need for, you know, even just getting an internship. What are those skills that will really support the students as they move forward in their academic and professional careers? And so that's the bulk of our work. And I should also mention that the way we do this is through a concept called real world learning, which for those who are not in education, um, real world learning is 
this concept that means it's active and it's applied and grounded in the world beyond school walls. So we're not just, uh, you know, sticking to traditional teaching models. We're really saying, how do we integrate the real world, what you'll actually be doing once you get out there in the classroom? How do we bridge that gap? And so that's, that's the overall view of what we're doing. And, um, it's really, it's inspiring because once we get to see the students doing the actual work through our programs, it, it really, uh, reinforces, at least for me, it reinforces exactly why we're working so hard every day. And so let's talk a little bit about this. I think the soft skills work that you're doing is really fascinating, especially as it relates to this podcast and, you know, our listeners are really keen on how to improve meetings and bettering their facilitation skills or helping their organizations have more facilitated leadership. And I'm really curious around those soft skill efforts and and what work you're doing there. Absolutely. Um, So as I mentioned, you know, the soft skills that we're building, we're trying to build them all the way from kindergarten up to high school. And uh, so things like critical thinking, things like collaboration, very often we'll hear from employers, you know, our students are great, um, or not the students that are great, but this, the folks that we hire are great on paper, but they really don't know how to, you know, make a decision. They don't know how to work in groups. They don't know how to apply thinking outside of specific direct instruction. What is, what is their creative process? How are they able to really translate this into something that's more than just A plus B equals C? What are the next steps? And so, you know, really trying to figure out how do we inspire the students? How do we teach this? Because it's not something that is very, you know, common in terms of like when you're at home and you're thinking, "What I'm going to teach my kid soft skills. I mean, you know, it's something like, how do you teach that? How do you integrate that? But how do you also integrate that within the traditional standards of learning? You know, schools still have to prepare for testing. They still have to meet those benchmarks for their schools. So how do we do that in a way that really serves the school, the students, and their future employers? And so in what ways do you think students are prepared to to be good collaborators? To be good collaborators? I think, I mean, so one of the, one of the programs that um, hits home for me is a program geared toward our middle school students um, and it's called the design challenge and fellowship and part of the program it you know it works with students and teachers but on the student side it's a real out-of-the-box learning experience for them students have to work in teams typically when we're meeting in person they would work in teams with individuals whom they don't know so it is that moment of like i'm starting a new job these are my new co-workers and we have to work together to get our work done to provide solutions that will satisfy our clients or our company and so forth and so um, it's really impressive to see the students at the beginning of the day they're very shy they're, they're not talking to the other kids that they don't know, or they're not talking to the adults who come from um, different community organizations and corporate organizations. We have volunteers who come in and work with them. They're very shy and not talking to anyone. And by the end of the day, they are taking charge. They are leading the presentations. They have ideas. They are throwing ideas out, ideas that are beyond this world and ideas that may not work for the specific project, but are still exciting. And it's just a way of saying, you know, let's try this thing. Maybe it doesn't work, but we're going to try it anyway. And to watch the students go from that journey it is, it, it really does build on their collaboration. They then are able to say, okay, I can do this in the classroom, or I can do this, you know, once they get to high school and they remember, oh, I did this in design challenge, I can do this at my internship or my part-time job. And then they'll be able to continue to do that and move forward. So when you think about, you know, good meeting skills and how students might be better prepared for the workforce, what, what sorts of things come to mind? as you think about the programming you're 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 already working on or things that you guys aspire to do absolutely i think you know for all of us as we adjust to we're still adjusting right to this remote learning this vir- not remote learning i'm sorry remote working this virtual working you know we're all starting to really have to 
evaluate and build our own um, meeting skills, particularly with you know, virtual meetings? What does it mean to be engaged? What does it mean to be a participant in a way where we're not sitting in a room and you might be able to, you know, jot something down on a dry erase board or just walk over and put this idea on the board and say, hey, I'm putting this post-it up. Um, how do I still become engaged? How do I also become um, an out-of-the-box thinker in terms of the work that I'm doing? Because now it's all online. I think, um, you know, for, for meetings in general, I think that's something that we're all having to tackle. I think uh, this current generation of students, um, even though it's very difficult for them, I think they will have a leg up as they start to move into the traditional world and start to have their own, you know, work-related meetings or class-related meetings, they'll be able to really utilize this time and say, okay, we did this while we were, you know, quarantined. I understand what it means to be on a Zoom call and to participate in this classroom um, meeting this way and so forth. So I think uh, for all of us, we're evaluating what it means to really be in a good meeting. And I think it is about what does it mean to, to, to really bring the work that you're doing physically into this collaborative space. Mm. In what ways have you seen the students really thrive in this era? Oh, I think students have, um, the students that we're working with, so we we traditionally work in um, low-income neighborhoods and schools. So we are definitely trying to affect and bring change to the students who um, who don't necessarily have the resources and services that their higher income peers do. And so in this time, as we're trying to figure out, okay, we have to serve them in the best way possible so that they can continue to have a quality education. And I think in our in our research and connecting with them and asking what do you need what are your struggles i think they have found some ownership in taking charge of their education i think students right now are showing up and saying i need x y and z in order to succeed and they're really finding their voice if that makes sense i think they're able to find their voice and say this is my education this is my future on the line I'm having, you know, to deal with X, Y, and Z at home, but I still need to continue to thrive academically. And I think it's a real sense of ownership, which I think will definitely carry them forward as they move through life, you know, just owning your work, owning your project, owning your job. So I think those that's something that's really sticking out to me. Interesting. So that, that sense of ownership, I, I never really thought of that as you know, that that's something that has to be learned, whether that's observed through a role model or whether that's observed in in school or some kind of training, or you know through peers on a, at a first job. So that's really fascinating that uh, you know the sense of ownership can be instilled as a, a learned skill. Oh, absolutely! I think you know when we think about. When I, or I should say, when I think about my own journey and what it means for me to have confidence in something, I think about, you know, that first moment when I approached whatever the situation was, whether it's a work-related project or a personal project, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do this thing. I don't really know exactly how I'm going to get it done, but I'm going to try. I'm going to do it. And then by the time I get to, you know, maybe another round of it or the end of the project, I, I, I know that I'm like, oh yeah, I, I have no doubt in my mind that I'll be able to achieve these goals. But that's also something that you have to experience. You know, it's back to that idea of real world learning. It's definitely something that you have to apply. It has to be active. You can't necessarily learn confidence without being put in situations in which you are challenged. You can't learn confidence or develop confidence without having to go through some sort of um, some sort of challenge that will that will make you think that will that will probably you know seem scary at first but then when you come out on the other side will seem like it was just nothing you know you're like whoa okay I can do this and I think that's important to know that or to note is that students who don't have those opportunities often will not develop those skills and so that's part of what we do we have to give them those opportunities that's amazing you know, it's, it seems like it's like one of those th like expert, what do they call it? The curse of knowledge or the expert phenomenon. It's like, once you know that that's important, it's hard to 
realize what it's like to not have that or not to not see it or not understand 100%. the importance. Yeah. Um, people just take it for granted. And so that's great that you're creating those opportunities because it's so needed. And when we talk about great meetings and great facilitation techniques, we're trying to tap into that. We're trying to, we're trying to nurture that in people. And if people don't understand that that's important, it's, you know, that seed has to be planted before we in the meeting trying to, trying to encourage that behavior. And so that's, it's really great that you guys are thinking about that work. I guess what, what are your note? What are you noticing as far as like, are there tipping points for, for folks, for students that when they, when they realize the importance or is there, have you ever noticed any kind of magical moments where they start to get like why some of this stuff's important? Oh, absolutely. I think I'm going to steal this story from a teacher who um, participated in the design challenge. I have my own stories that I've witnessed, but I've recently fallen in love with this story after hearing it just a few weeks ago. Um, the tipping point, you know, it's different for each individual student. And we, you know, we give them these opportunities and these programs and we're giving them these skills that they can then translate into various, various avenues. And so there was a student um, who, um, as described by the teacher, was not a high performing student in terms of grades on paper. And the student didn't really seem to exude, you know, any leadership or confidence or critical thinking was kind of like a, I, I'm, I'm going to say C student just for the purpose of this story. I, I don't know for sure, but the student mm -hmm. might have been like a C student or something like that. Wasn't really someone who the teacher thought, okay, this person, you know, I'd put them in this group with the higher achieving students. Um, after attending our design day challenge, one of our design day challenges, the student then started to organize different things within the school. The student organized um, social activism and justice events. The student became involved in the theater department. The student became involved in, I believe it was like the math club. So different avenues, but not just involved. The student started leading leading the charge for all of those things. And so teaching other students how to make costumes, being like, you know, the person who started up the math club. And all of that, this teacher said, stemmed from learning leadership qualities and creative thinking and teamwork, all of that from design challenge. Um, the teacher said that after design challenge, they noticed a complete difference in the student. And so, you know, we never truly know what the tipping point will be. But without that experience, this person would have never reached their potential or started to reach their potential. The teacher would not have seen what this particular student could have done. And where would that inspiration and creativity have come from, if not from this activity? And so, I mean, I, I, I love that story because I'm just like, you, you just truly never know how any of the students are going to then translate this. You know, we have our, our traditional teaching and, you know, our grading and so forth and all of those benchmarks. But then when you think about how far the imagination can travel, I mean, this is just the example that I'm like, can I, can I walk around with a t-shirt with this on it? <laughs> or like, you know, a 60 second video or something that just, that does like a cartoon that shows Person A started here and then ended up here. It's really exciting. So I think the tipping point is it's it's different, but I mean, it just, it comes from this kind of work. Yeah, it's amazing that the teacher saw the change in behavior afterwards and it was so visible and recognizable. I, I think we see that sort of thing happening on teams as well. You know, whether they go through a workshop that's, transformative they can see that there's a way there's a different way to work there's a different way to think about how we come together and and make decisions and do things and they go back and they're never the same also i think i'm curious to hear too if you see this with the students but often in these types of scenarios because people are able to out color outside of the lines of their their kind of official role and they're able to try new things and explore capabilities, personalities, skills, strengths that no one knew about them start to surface. 
fact, I had oh, yes. one one manager tell me I had no idea that my team could do these things. And so it impacted her ability to lead the team and to work with them and get more out of the team. And the team had more enthusiasm because they got to do new things and explore new new stuff. So I'm kind of curious, like, how does that, I'm sure that comes up in, in your work as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just to continue on with that example, I mean, that teacher saying, I never saw the potential until this moment. Mm. I never saw it until after this happened. That's one way. I think for us, it comes through, you know, our, our program design. We are constantly making sure that we're adjusting and adapting our programs based on, you know, what the needs are. But then we also get inspired by what's happening in real time and what students are, are yearning for. And so, that, that just translates. And I think that's, you know, that's something that's true of good leadership all around as you see how your team, how the folks you're working with, how they respond to certain things. And it's like, okay, that's their way in. We're going to do more of that because that has created, you know, something that we could have never imagined. So shifting gears a little bit here, I want to just kind of come back to, to meeting specifically. And so, um, Love to hear some of your personal favorites, ways to make meetings better. <laughs> I think, uh, so I'm laughing because I'm sure many folks can relate as we continue on our virtual meetings. It's like, okay, how do we, how do we get through these meetings? So I think virtually is the thing that's coming to mind. How do I make a virtual meeting better? Mm -hmm. um, I love activities that uh, build team spirit or team bonding that teach us different things about the individuals with whom we're connecting. Very often we get down and we sit down and we get right to business. And so those moments where we can just stop and say, let's, let's, let's put an icebreaker here, or let's just have a check-in and see where everybody is. I, I love check-ins personally, because sometimes you need to put you know, something in the space so that you can move on. And it's like, okay, let's put that out there and we can move on from it. Um, so I think those are fun, creative ways to to really make meetings better. I also think that just um, when I lead meetings, I, I try to encourage some sort of cyclical leadership, so to speak. I think it's great to pass the baton and say, you know, I'll facilitate some of this, but you have ideas. Let's hear from you. You know, let's have someone else step up to the plate. And so I think that's a great way too. So I always like to say that questions are the facilitator's Swiss army knife and <laughs> having really great questions is such a powerful way to help a team move forward, to shift the way that they're looking at the world. And, you know, I just interviewed Jean Deviche for the podcast and he has this really interesting model around what he calls thought structures. And he said this, that most teams struggle because at any given time, anyone in the room or in the meeting, anybody in the team or just everyone is operating in different thought structures. There may be some overlap, but for the most part, people are probably in one mode versus the other. And so getting people to move and think and shift those thought structures, I think he takes a very academic view on it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of detailing these thought structures and it's there's a lot of um kind of behavioral psychology and different elements baked into it but at the end of the day i think the way that facilitators do this through practice through self-discovery even if they don't label it as these different thought patterns they are shifting thought patterns and they are helping people realize the world from a new lens and to take on different perspectives and so I think questions can be so powerful. And especially when you're um, working with, with students, I, I, I assume that you have lots of great provocative questions. So I'm curious, what are some of your favorites? Oh, my. Um, I think, the well, you know, the questions vary depending on what the project and the program are. Um, I think one of the ways that we do that is um, we've adapted, you know, the design thinking cycle. We've adapted that um that kind of national international model to fit what we're doing. So we have what we call the STC design thinking process. Um, so we try to ask various questions and in, um, in the cyclical, again, back to that circle, that cyclical 
uh, form, you know, seek understanding, test it out and continuously improve. And so throughout that process, that's where we're really getting into the questions. I don't know that there are specific questions that we are, um, asking all the time. I think, I think it really does vary. I mean, mm. I, I can say from working from, I say volunteering because I am not someone who consistently works on the program side. So anytime I get to work with the students directly, I'm considered a volunteer. <laughs> and so from one of my own volunteering experiences, I would say there was a student who wanted, we were working on the redesign of, um, I think it was a redesign of a very specific area in the city in um, Newark, New Jersey. And they wanted to put in like this huge sports arena, but it, the space was so limited. And so I said, okay, so you want to do like the sports arena? How do we do this while simultaneously creating an area that maybe your grandmother might want to go sit in? You know, maybe she's not into as much of the sports as you are, but she still needs to access this space. So it's it's really, I think the question then becomes, how do we do that and? I think it's a yes and, which I'm gonna steal from improv. Yes, let's do that. And what else, what else? So I think that's probably the biggest question that I find myself asking. I love it. Yes and is so powerful. We, we use that a ton in facilitation and rely on it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so I guess that brings up an interesting point, which is you have a background in acting, theater. Uh, I'm sure you have some experience with improv. I'm, I'm curious if you brought that into any of your meetings and how you've applied any of those skills. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, all of the icebreakers or activities that I prepare for a meeting, I take from um, my theatrical background. I think also just my approach to meetings is probably more from an artistic viewpoint than any other because I am someone who's like, you know, I I, I do want to feel all the feelings and I want to do all the things. So, you know, sometimes it's like, no, we're just going to do the things. It's like, no, we have to feel the feelings and do the things. When we feel the feelings, it makes our work better. <laughs> so I, I approach, you know, any sort of meeting, whether it's professionally or personally, I approach it from that, um, that viewpoint. I would even say like talking with my family members on the phone or on a Zoom call these days, I'm always like, we're, you know, we're going to do something. I'm just going to bring us all into the room together, even though we're not physically there, are just ways to bring us closer. And so um, I steal all the time from from acting exercises and from improv games, because they're also great ways to make people feel safe. And I think that's also, you know, something that's super important in any kind of meeting is that you have to be willing to take chances and risks because those are the things that lead to the great ideas. And you only are able to do that when you feel safe. And I would also say, um, just kind of tying it back to schools that can, I mean, that's that's one of the things that we feel passionate about too, is that we're giving students a safe place to make the mistake. I don't like to use the word fail because failing isn't mm. it. It's about making the mistakes and learning from it and saying, okay, I learned one way not to do it, or I learned what not to do the next time. And so I think for all of us, no matter how old we are, whether we are K to 12 education, whether we're in college, whether we are adults running companies and so forth, just those creating that safe environment. And so artistically, I try to do that, but it's so important for us to do that just in general. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I find that folks from academia or, or, you know, K through 12 learning education, the word fail is they're a lot more sensitive to it. <laughs> the startup folks, you know, they're more playful with it. And but yeah, yeah, to your point, it's like, sure. We don't, we don't want to get an F. We don't want to think about it as like totally like flunking, but, um, but there has to be some learning had, there has to be, we had to have an experimental mindset and know what, that there's things that can be taken, um, taken away from it. So I think that's, that's keen and important for sure. And I think it was Thomas Edison, I believe it was Thomas Edison who said, you know, I found, uh, I don't know the exact number, this is not going to bode well for me, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I found, you know, hundreds and thousands of ways 
not to do it before he finally figured out how. So that's mm. what we all have to do. Absolutely. And so when you know, I love to ask people about teams that struggle to maintain momentum, you know, after an ideation session and how, how do they, how do they continue to build upon that energy that was created through, through this joyous and through this fun work and, um, and make sure we maintain that even after we go back to the, the, the normal classroom or and back to the, to the, to the everyday grind. So I know I'm just kind of curious when you're working with the students, are there things that you found that kind of help them stay the course or keep the momentum going? Um, I think definitely, you know, community involvement. And by that, I mean like the volunteers that we engage because the volunteers are all coming from different organizations, different corporations and so forth. I think having someone from another field, someone outside of education and having, you know, this influence and ideally or essentially really um, this aspect of mentorship, I think that helps the students continue and to move on. They get to see real life examples of things, of careers and jobs that they didn't know existed. And so it, you know, it sets a little fire inside like, okay. Um, but also it, you know, it's, it's hearing from someone who isn't their teacher it's it's sort of that thing where, you know, your mom or your dad can tell you, mm-hmm. don't do this thing because of X, Y, and Z. But then the neighbor next door says it, and because they're not your mom or dad, you really get it. <laughs> so I think it's a little bit of that. I think those influences, and just not just that too, but but also having different ways and different approaches, you know? One person's approach may not sit with that particular student and so here we have someone who works for a major financial institution who is approaching it from a different angle and really working toward the same goals excellent well i think that brings us to our completion here it's been really lovely chatting with you today and hearing about the the awesome work that uh, you and schools who can are doing and um, I guess I just want to give you an opportunity to leave a message for our listeners. What would you like them to be thinking about and considering right now? I think that's a, that's a tough one. There's so many things. <laughs> so to boil it down. But I think, I think maybe one of the biggest is that, you know, don't underestimate our youth, our students, don't try to put them in small boxes and say they can only do so much, especially students who come from, um, you know, we serve, as I mentioned, low income communities, marginalized communities, really say, if we give the students the opportunity to do this, what could they potentially do? And if we don't limit them to our imagination, how far will they go? I think if we think like that, we'll be able to really see the next generation create some pretty incredible scientific, medical, um, financial, artistic, you know, architectural. We'll be able to see them create some fantastic uh, offerings to the world. And it has to, you know, we have to really think outside of our own boxes and say, I'm going to give them what they need. I'm not going to limit them to just what I think they can handle because they really can handle a lot more and they will, they will, they will essentially be better off for it. Incredible. Thank you so much, Kristen. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and um, I wish you the best of luck in all the work you're doing. I think it's really important and excited to see that someone is shaping our future leaders. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on today. Thanks for joining me for another episode of control the room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together. VoltageControl.com